Diving into your next act or wondering what's ahead? Enjoy life as you change your path and embrace your authentic self. Join me as we discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly of making big changes in your life. New directions both personally and professionally shake things up. But don't worry, you are not alone. On each episode, we'll be sharing stories, providing valuable information, and introducing you to others navigating their next act. So let's get inspired. This is a Candy Factory Convo, Life in the Next Act with Gail Shane. Welcome to Life in the Next Act. Today, we will be talking with Shannon Miller, licensed clinical social worker and founder of Apricity Behavioral Health, which provides mental health talk therapy services to expatriates anywhere around the world. Shannon will be discussing the need for mental health services to expatriates. She will also share important tips for good mental health. An expatriate herself, Shannon will tell us how to set and achieve goals while in therapy. Hello and welcome, Shannon. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So Shannon, tell us a little about you, your career change, and your experience as an expatriate. So I was born and raised here in Lancaster County, and I left when I went to college, became an elementary school teacher and lived in Arlington, Virginia, Arlington, Alexandria, Virginia for a while, um, where I met my husband, who is an army officer. And from that point on then is when I became an expat. So we lived in Senegal. We came back to Monterey, California, then um, here, well, in Washington, D.C. for a little bit. And then we went overseas to Rwanda, um, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Italy, and now Israel. And I also lived in Switzerland by myself. At some point in there, I went off and did a long-term substitute teaching thing in, in Switzerland. So. so it's many countries and many continents. Yes. And were you um, married the whole time as, so, through your travels? Yeah. So in Switzerland, no, I was just, I was there by myself. I was me. And then in Senegal, um, we were not married, but we were together. And otherwise I've been married at the other ones. And then I became a mom when we were in Zimbabwe. And how did you uh, decide to become a therapist? Through my expat experience, um, I was seeing lots and lots of untreated, undiagnosed mental health problems because there was no way to treat them. Um, online therapy wasn't really that much of a thing at the time. Often the cultures we're living in don't really support mental health. Um, people were being sent back to America for treatment. And often it was a career ender where it would have just been easier if they could have been treated while they were um, what we would call at post. Um, meaning, you know, that they didn't have to go home here to America to get to get treatment. They could stay in the country where they were located. Um, I loved being a teacher, but I just didn't see myself being stuck in a classroom with a bunch of kids for the rest of my life. Um, and so I just decided to go for it. And, and pursue that. And and Shannon, why is there such a need for mental health services for expatriates? Um, for that thing I just mentioned, well, on the online format, because often we live in places that don't place an emphasis on mental health, but often we're living in places where we had one idea of it. And then when we get there, it's something totally different. And so there's often this sort of integration um, issues that we work through. The other thing is wherever you go, there you are. If you are somebody that has anxiety or depression, um, wherever you're at now, you're going to have it in your next location as well. And so we offer continuity that when you're moving between countries, you don't have to change therapists. The meaning of apricity is warmth of the sun. Yes. Why did you choose that name? One, because I love that feeling. Um, I love going outside and it's freezing cold and the sun, but the sun feels really warm. Um, and then it struck me as a very good metaphor for having a good therapist or being in very good therapy where things can feel off in your world, but that hour 
or hour and a half that you're spending with your therapist can can be warming, can be life changing. Well, hopefully, it'll be life changing. Um, and so it was just kind of like the respite from the cold. And um, in your practice, you have several therapists. Are yes. they um, expatriates as well? Yes, that's sort of a requirement that I make of everybody because you don't want to, as an expatriate seeking therapy, you don't want to spend um, half your session that you're paying for explaining the expatriate context and things like that. You just want somebody that implicitly understands so that there are some things that don't have to be explained ad nauseum. Um, so yeah, everybody that works in the practice is an expatriate. We have a therapist in Portugal, one in Japan, one in Costa Rica, and one currently in Belize, but headed to Moscow. Wow. So um, apricity, warmth of the sun, and uh, finding a place to feel comfortable and, and warm. Yes. I like that. Sun. That's our goal. Yeah. Um, Shannon, what is good mental health and what are the most important tips you could share with our listeners about good mental health? That's a loaded question. Um, and a, we could talk for hours on that one. But I would say good mental health isn't the absence of uncomfortable feelings or situations. Good mental health is the ability to feel the feels and recover if recovery is necessary, right? And to understand that our feelings are transient, they come and they go, both the good and the bad. And it is about being able to walk through that experience, keeping the self intact. In other words, you don't become your feelings. You have them, you experience them, but you're not defined by them. And that's sort of a very broad, general answer to, to a, a and, question and that could take many answers. Well, what about the people who, who say, I just want to be happy? Don't we all? Um, yes, that's usually a good entry point into therapy, but then working with your therapist, we're going to get down to defining what is it that makes you happy? How will you know when you're happy? What? Um, how are you currently defining happiness? You know, Because right now, there seems to be a confusion between joy and happiness. And we expect ourselves to ultimately stay in a state of joy endlessly, but we can't. Just like we don't stay in any other state permanently. Um, and so maybe redefining happiness a little bit, but then as well, that statement's just the entry point into unearthing what's really going on. Shannon, how do you get people to talk who don't want to talk? Well, our practice is interesting because we don't have like mandated clients. So usually people that are coming into therapy with us have put in a lot of effort to actually get to us um, and they want to be in therapy. If we start dancing around topics that become uncomfortable, that they don't necessarily want to talk about, that it stirs things up, there's a lot of reminding them that's what they're there for, that therapy isn't pretty. Um it's not going to be neat. In fact, I often say it's messy, it's ugly, but the end result will be worth it. Um, expatriates are Americans living in foreign countries, and um, they could be um, working for the State Department, they could be working at embassies, they could be teachers, business people, missionaries, uh, Rosetta Stone teachers. Um, what are the many topics of mental health that you specialize in for expatriates? So all of our therapists are basically what we would just describe as generalists. So we see a lot of depression and anxiety. And then several of our um, therapists have sort of add-on certifications. We have one therapist that specializes in addiction. Um, we have one just specific couples therapist um, but mostly people come to us with depression, anxiety, sometimes relocation depression, which is where the mood sort of dips when the newness of someplace wears off. And then you're like, wait, I, I'm, I got to be here. I got to do this. I don't like it. Um, we also often see PTSD, moral injury, which is sort of the sister to PTSD, 
We have religious trauma that we see, people that grew up in very dogmatic religions, and they're now trying to deconstruct and process what that meant and the effects it's had on their life. Um, that seems to be the overwhelming majority of what they are. Sometimes we need parenting counseling. Um, the the person that's coming to us is carrying an unusual, unusually heavy emotional load for their family to manage transitions for their children as well. I, I like that you mentioned uh, that relocation depression because you would think moving to a new country would be fun, but not necessarily. And um, it can be, yeah. What what is typical though is that there's sort of this culture shock arc that people go on where we're super excited. Everything's new, great, interesting, fun. Um, and then that wears off. And then what used to be sort of a novelty then becomes this grating irritation. And it's coming to terms with that and figuring out how you yourself will navigate your way through it. Um, and sort of giving you some of those strategies. We don't give you the answers, but we ask the questions that will lead you to kind of come up with your own plan of how to move forward. And sometimes that plan may be, I'm not going to stay in this country. When counseling couples, what are the most common things that couples uh, frequently argue about? And how do you counsel couples? So I personally do not counsel couples. I leave that to um, Christine, our therapist that's in Portugal. And she's trained in both the Gottman and the Imago methodologies. The things that we see quite a bit, um, basically the spouses are on two different pages. One wants one thing, the other wants another, and they talk past each other. Or the goal is the same, but the getting there looks very different for both of them. So a lot of times it's on two different pages is, you know, one spouse wants to be done with this life of lifestyle and the other wants to keep going or one wants to um, deepen their ties where they are. And the other just wants to leave it as it is. So uh, the Gottman and Imago methodologies that you mentioned, does that mm -hmm. mean that your therapist, Christine, mm -hmm. uh, that she would use different approaches depending on the couple or the situation? Yes to both of that. So good therapy is client-led. In other words, yes, I'm trained in these methods, but if the method's not working for you, what's the point in doing it? We got to do what works for you. And so it's sort of a rhythm. And that's the art of therapy is for the therapist to figure out what works for the client? What way do I need to frame this or discuss it so that it makes the most sense to them and they're getting something out of it? Um, both methods, I mean, the Gottmans are very well known in the industry and Imago is becoming more well known. Um, it's not one of the, it's not one of the ones that have made its way into pop culture yet or pop psycho psychological culture yet. Shannon, I think you answered this earlier, but I think it's worth repeating. What are the top mental health challenges that you face today? I always tell my clients, all roads lead back to anxiety. Usually, if if it's not something pathologically wrong, in other words, where there is something wrong in your brain, if this is situational, it goes back to anxiety. That can show up for you as depression, um, which it usually does. Those two are usually best friends. Depression and anxiety typically go hand in hand. Um, we see religious trauma, compassion fatigue is one I didn't mention before, and that's when you just get burnout from giving and then you become angry, and then you become angry at yourself for the fact that you're angry because you're there to give. Um, what else was there? Relocation depression, and that's very specific to, you know, depression related to just moving, moving around and, and being in a new place. But practically speaking, whatever it is you come to us with, we will tell you right up front whether or not we can treat you. And there are going to be some people that it's not appropriate for us to treat um, via video conferencing, which is how we do everything. And so we would um, cover that in the first 15-minute session that we do. So that's my next question. How do your clients connect with you and set goals? So connecting with us, you can find us on 
the internet. I mean, we have our webpage at apricitybehavioralhealth.com. Um, we're also listed in the International Therapist Directory. Um, I personally am listed in a bunch of individual directories, as are a lot of my therapists. So we're out there. But if you just Google, Google Apricity, and I think we've mastered the Google monster enough now that we show up on the first page, um, if you do that. But Apricity Behavioral Health will lead you to us. So um, you schedule that 15 minute consultation oh, and you, yes, you realize, okay. you know, are you a good fit? And so we then, have a go ahead. Sorry. No, no go. Um, we have a contact us page on it. So you're going to fill out a form on there. And basically you're going to say, Hey, what, what's a good time for us to call you? What's your phone number? Where are you located? Do you have a preferred therapist that you want? And then we really like it. If you give us just a little bit of insight as to what's going on, um, because if you don't have a therapeutic preference, we know better which therapist to sort of assign you to. From there, we schedule a 15-minute intro session. And that's really sort of a logistical one where we go over how everything works um, and get a better idea of what's going on and whether or not we can be helpful to you and, and sort of what brings you to therapy. Um, and then from there, you would create an account and have a session. We use Zoom. I like to say we were on Zoom before it was a thing, um, but yeah. And how do you help your clients set the goals? That's important, isn't it? Um, well, it depends. Yes, goals are important, absolutely. Because I always start out by saying, what needs to be different for you to say this was my, worth my time, my effort, and my money? I want to know what change you want to see. And then, you know, I go back to that question again of, well, how will you know when we've achieved it? How do you know when our work together is done? And we basically set up some thresholds or tripwires of very practical things that we can see. Now, what happens is as we're trying to meet these goals, therapy can tend to take on two different levels where there's the cognitive behavioral stuff on top. And that's very much the day-to-day -day, um, behavioral stuff, exactly what it's called. But then underneath that, getting to the root of why it's happening, sometimes we go into more psychodynamic stuff. Um, so again, the therapist is always keeping the goals in mind. It just may not feel like that. It's not that scripted from session to session. And how would a client know that they've accomplished or they're finished or they don't need any more therapy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that varies from person to person, really, but it's it's a mutual agreement between the client and the therapist. We like to wrap up therapy and not have you just ghost us um, because it is a relationship that you that you get into with your therapist. That I mean that's the cornerstone to everything is having that good relationship with your therapist. And so it's it's something that the two of you would mutually decide on of, okay, have we met? this objective, this objective, you know, and that's very sterile talking about things that are sort of um, very, they can feel elusive at times. So you just keep having that ongoing dialogue and the therapist will get a feel for it and perhaps start mentioning it um, when he or she feels that you're edging closer to quote unquote being done. Um, and then we kind of decide what we're going to do when we're done meeting on such a regular basis. Like, Hey, do you want to have just check-ins? Do you want to reach out to us when you need us? What do you want that to look like? And again, we make it client centered. What works for you? Uh, Shannon, I, I saw this on, on your website, which I love. Apricity. Thank you. Behavioralhealth.com. Mm -hmm. um, how, Im I don't know if you wrote this, so, but how important is smiling? Oh, I did write that. Um, so this just came out in a blog that I did of what, how to, um, I'll clean it up for your podcast, how to give a darn when you don't have any left to give. And smiling is one of them because your brain doesn't actually understand the difference between a fake smile and a real smile. So it's going to release those chemicals. So you want it you just want to smile. Your brain will follow suit. It will give you those feel-good chemicals eventually. We're not talking you're going to go from being distraught to gleeful, 
but it's enough to sort of keep you going. It's also contagious. When you receive that smile back, that's also a dopamine hit. That's a reward for you. So you smile at somebody, they smile back, you get the dopamine hit, and it sort of grows on itself at that point. The same as if you're around grumpy, sad people, that's going to feed off of you too, right? You're around an energy drainer. It's going to drain your energy. Um, so it goes both ways. Shannon, I have listened. So tell us about your new podcast. Yeah. So the new podcast is called Dear Sigmund and it's with um, Dr. J.P. Shand and myself, who's a board certified psychiatrist. Um, basically, we're just answering, it's a question and answer <laughs> format where we're just answering mental health questions in a very conversational, matter of fact way, trying to add a little bit of levity to it. Um, yes, mental health is a serious topic, but we don't have to make it laborious to talk about it. Um, and we can have some fun with it. So it's Dear Sigmund, question and answers. Um, you can submit a question through the form. And, and we don't necessarily want to know the identity of who's asking us questions. It's best probably to remain anonymous. So you go onto our website, dearsigmund.com, and you can leave us an audio message, a text message, or an email, and then listen. We'll answer it. And again, I've listened, and it's great. I love it. Thank you. Thanks for Thank you. Um, that service to our world. Yeah. yeah Shannon. Jane, oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, JP and I talked about it last time that I, I was joking that you know, we bill for our services. This is your chance to get a therapist and a psychiatrist to talk to you for free. Yeah. So, yeah. Again, really, thank you very, mm -hmm. very much. Um, which nonprofit is important to you and why? I would say Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which we lovingly call CHOP around here. That's important to me because it's touched the lives of my immediate family and every time I'm there, I'm just marveled at all the children that desperately need it, to need the compassion and the level, world-class care that, that you can get there. Shannon, do you have uh, any last word about mental health? May is National Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, I would say last word about mental health is don't fall for the Instagram, Facebook, TikTok versions of mental health, that it's sometimes good mental health isn't pretty. Sometimes it's having a boundary that's hard to enforce. It's not going to be um, rainbows and puppy dogs all the time, but that doesn't mean there's something wrong necessarily. Shannon, thank you so much for being with us today. Shannon's specialty is helping Americans living in foreign countries but she and her team can talk to anyone. You can reach Shannon at apricitybehavioralhealth.com. You can find the Test Yourself page to see if you would benefit from their services. And I'd like to leave you with this. Some people could be given an entire field of roses and only see the thorns in it. Others could be given a single weed and only see the wildflower in it. Perception is a key component to gratitude, and gratitude is a key component to joy. Please join us next time as we aim to inspire, empower, and inform. Life in the Next app is a proud member of the Candy Factory Collective. You can find the show streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and LinkedIn. And you could subscribe to the audio version anywhere you get your podcasts. Gail has experienced many acts over the years. Living a full life, she is a mother of two and grandmother of three, and currently calls Lancaster, PA home. An entrepreneur at heart, she's owned several businesses, hosted a popular radio show, and has written for prominent publications highlighting nonprofits. While she holds her real estate license in Florida and PA, she believes her true calling is giving others a voice. Learn more about Gail at gailshane.com. Life in the Next Act is produced by the Candy Factory Collective at the Candy Factory Coworking Campus in Lancaster, PA. Production support by Jason Mundock and Anna Tran. Administrative support by Ann Kirby, Ariana Henderson, and Krisha Martzel. Notes and links can be found on the show post at our website, candyfactorycollective.com. Candy Factory. Collective.